prenez siège si, si tu veux. Ok, ça c'est parti. C'est juste pour enregistrer le jour. Donc je verrai lorsque, lorsque je fais ça. Ok, so let me now introduce to you guys uh, Professor Stephen Arnand. If you're one of my students, you already know a few things about Professor Arnand, but uh, for the other ones, you should know that Professor Arnand is a professor of cognitive science at the University du Québec à Montréal and at the University of Southampton in Britain. His main research interests include category learning, language evolution, and consciousness. For more than 20 years now, Professor Alain has also been one of the pioneers of the so-called open access movement. So it's not a surprise to me, frankly, that Professor Alain is giving you guys permission to share any part of this talk today. It's in line with the open access movement. Thanks to his significant contribution to the dissemination of knowledge, he was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Liège in Belgium. Now, my students in this room are keenly aware, and that's the least I can say, keenly aware of the important role played by peer-reviewed academic publications. This may be the phrase, so peer-reviewed academic publications that I use most often, right, during my lectures. Now, Professor Alain has written or co-written more than 300 of them. So more than 300 peer-reviewed academic publications. In addition to having been the editor-in-chief of two different peer-reviewed academic journals, he has founded and edited the influential journal Behavioral and Brain Sciences for 23 years, and is currently the editor-in-chief of another journal, which was launched last year, and which is called Animal Sentience. Now, this journal, that is Animal Sentience, uh, publishes findings on, amongst others, what and how animals feel. And this is certainly relevant to the content of Professor Hanlon's talk today, which will be about René Descartes' error and animal identity. So, without any further delay, let us warmly welcome Professor Stephen Arnaud. So, make a sign to Sarah and to Rebecca when you've finished your questionnaire. She wants to gather them up already. I see somebody's already making signs. Just, they'll pick them up already. Uh, I'm going to use them at some point in my talk, so they have to do some analysis and then, and then I'll uh, give you the results. Um, René Descartes is arguably one of the most influential philosophers uh, in the, since, since the uh, Western post-Greek philosophy. Uh, and he's rightly revered for uh, some of the things that he contributed, but he's also uh, guilty of not only having supported something abominable, but of doing it while violating his own, his own principles. One of the things that uh, René Descartes wanted to do was, uh, there he is with uh, Princess Christina of uh, Sweden, who was tutoring. Bicap is the one with the mustache standing up. Um, his objective was to set knowledge and science on an objective foundation, on, a, on, a, on a, something you could believe in. So he asked questions about what, what you could be sure about and what you could doubt. And he especially focused on doubt. He said, there's lots of things that, that could be true. It's not, this is not about whether it's true or not. It's about whether you can be sure it's true. What can you be sure is true? For example, uh, he, Descartes came before Newton, but of course Newton had his famous uh, law, law of uh, gravitation, the universe of gravitation that came from the fact that apples fell down towards the earth. But um, Descartes when he said that among the things that you can't be sure about, as I said, this is before um, Newton, is that apples will always keep falling down. Who's, what's, how, do you, how can you be sure that they don't start falling up starting tomorrow? He's not doubting that, that animals fall down. 
He's not even doubting that animals fall, may, fall, may fall down forever. But he's saying you can't be sure. And it's not just that, which means all of the laws of nature. You can't be sure of the things that scientists tell you are, are the laws of nature. They're likely to be true. All the evidence seems to support them. But it's not sure. But So he asked, what can we be sure of? And there's one thing we can be sure of, and that's the the truths of mathematics. Now, I said two and two is four. I'm not going to bother you with technical stuff, but uh, it, two and two is four is true only if you s assume that the axioms of arithmetic, Peano's axioms, are true. But never mind. Once you assume a set of axioms, there are certain things that follow that are necessarily true. And I'm going to be talking about necessity today. So, so uh, one of the ways that you can be sure that something is true if, if it, is if it's necessarily true. Necessarily means it's true on pain of contradiction. If it were false, it would lead to a contradiction, something of the form uh, of uh, it's Thursday today, and it's, it's true that it's Thursday today, and it's not true that it's Thursday today. That's nonsense. Anything that leads to a contradiction, is, 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 that means nothing. So the truths of mathematics, you can be absolutely dead certain they're true because they're true on pain of contradiction. Science is not true for sure. Um, even you know the fact that, that there's that, that other people have minds is not sure. I mean, you know people and you and you you assume that they like you have a mind, but uh, you can't be sure because you're not in their heads. Uh, you can't. Not only can you not be sure that they have minds, you can't even be sure that they exist. Sure, I remember I was talking about what you can be sure about, not about what's true. They do exist, and don't start getting nightmares about uncertainty. But this very, very um, strict, rig rigorous criterion, which is certainty, doesn't apply to the laws of science. It doesn't apply to apples falling down rather than up. It doesn't apply to the existence of the outside world. It doesn't apply to the uh, minds of others. Maybe all of this is just the figment of your imagination. You can't be sure that it isn't. So is there anything else that's true besides uh, mathematics? Well, he came up with one other one. How many people already knew the cogito? Okay. I'm not, you're going to hear it again, but you're not going to hear it the usual way. The cogito is, I think, I'm thinking, therefore I exist. That's another thing to be sure of. I can be sure that I exist because I'm thinking. If you look at it closely, and we're not here for a philosophy lecture, so I won't give you all the details. In fact, the only reason that you can be sure that you're thinking when you're thinking is that it feels like something to be thinking. And when you're feeling that, it makes no sense to doubt it. It's, it's the same thing as a, as a contradiction to say, well, it feels like I'm thinking, but maybe I'm not thinking. Maybe I'm flying. That doesn't make sense. And in fact, if you, if you focus on feeling itself, if somebody's pinching you, right, uh, maybe the person doesn't exist. Maybe you don't have skin. Maybe it's all a hallucination, but it hurts. And there's no way you can say that maybe it's just, maybe I just, I'm mistaken, maybe it, it, it doesn't really hurt. So the second thing that has the force of absolute certainty, like mathematics, is on the absolute opposite end of the universe from mathematics. Mathematics is all formal uh, 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 symbol manipulation according to the logic of rules, whereas um, subjective feeling is on the exact opposite end, and yet that's the other certainty which is that when you're feeling something, you're feeling that. The rest of it, about existence, etc., um, is a little bit more complicated, a little bit more theoretical. I don't think Descartes is on such solid ground there, but that's not the error I want to talk about. The error I want to talk about, I don't know what, yeah. Uh, the animal, the, the, oops, I jumped ahead, yeah. Um, so, I, I, you replace cogito ergo sum, which is I think, therefore I am, with sentio ergo sentitur, uh, I, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling something, therefore some feeling is going on. There's no way that when you're feeling something that you can say, well, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm not feeling anything, maybe I don't, I'm not, there, there's no one feeling anything. Now, other certainties, as I mentioned, were um, you can't be sure that the outside world exists, you can't be sure about your own personal identity. This is a conference on identity. But you can't really be sure, I don't know if I should tell this anecdote now, maybe I will. I'm still in the part of the talk where, where I can be lighthearted and make jokes. <laughs> I'm going to get to a part where I'm going to become very unlike myself and all of the smiles will be gone. But I'll tell you an anecdote about personal identity um, and the cogito. 
I, w I, li I was living in New Jersey when I was, when I was uh, at Princeton, and it was Christmas, and I had to get, um, I had to get some last-minute Christmas presents. So I, and it was a long time ago, so $30 meant something then. So I, I, I was going down to Quaker Bridge Mall to buy some small Christmas presents with my car, but the car was low in gas. So I said, okay, I'll get ten dollars, even that, I'll, I'll get ten dollars worth of gas. Today, ten dollars worth of gas probably wouldn't have gotten me to Quaker Ridge Mall. So I went to the gas station. Oh, I, I, I had thirty dollars in my pocket. I counted my thirty dollars in my pocket. I went to the gas station. I rolled down my windshield. It was cold. I said, uh, put in twenty dollars worth, and here's the twenty. And I gave him the twenty dollar pay in advance. And so he filled the tank. And then he comes and knocks on my, my, uh, my window and he says, $20, please. I said, I just gave you the $20. He says, what do you mean you gave me the $20? And he goes like this with his pockets and he gives a half, half, funny half smile on his face. He talks to his colleague, he says, this guy says he gave me $20 before I gave him the gas. I just gave I said, I'm not taking any bullshit. Uh, and, I, and I drove off. What surprised me was that uh, he threw a rock at my car. I said, that's going a little bit too far. He was doing a con job on me. He has his 20 bucks. Why would he go so far? So I went home, and around 10.30, I get a phone call from the New Jersey State Police that he reported me. He reported me as having gone away without paying for the gas. And I said, look, I'm going to tell you what happened, and you draw your own conclusions. I told, I told him what I told you. I said, I gave him the 20 bucks, and then he pretended I didn't give it to him, and then he threw a rock in my car. I said, okay, never mind. And they dropped it. But to this day, to this day, I can't be certain that I gave him that twenty dollars. Maybe you know. Often it happens to you that you you, you plan you plan to do a lot of things, and then and then uh, and then you go through the steps, and, and the thing that you plan to do there, you think you already did it, but in fact all you did was plan to do it. You didn't do it. So there's a little bit of uncertainty like that sometimes. And imagine how that uncertainty can stretch across your entire lifetime. You're pretty sure that the person who's sitting in this chair now is the one who was sitting wherever you were sitting at this time yesterday or, ten, or, or whatever you mean 10 years ago. You have this feeling right now, what your feeling is, I'm the same person. So you have this feeling that your identity is constant. But that's not the part you can be sure of. That's not the Cartesian part. You can be sure that whatever you're feeling now, that's what it feels like. But you sure can't be sure that that's what it is like. Right? Maybe you just came into existence. This is all. It's kept, okay, this is not true, but this is possible. You came into existence at the moment when you had the feeling that you're sitting here and you remember that I've been going to Dawson College for two years, etc. All of that could be um, wrong. This is the, the extent to which the Cartesian insight about certainty and doubt goes. It, it, it even applies to personal identity. The fact that you're feeling, you can't doubt. But what you're feeling, you know, certainly I can be hallucinating, I can literally be hallucinating something right now. So I see a, uh, a green uh, flying thing over there. It's not there, it's in my head. Uh, it feels like there's a green flying thing there. I can't doubt that. But I can certainly doubt that there is a green flying thing there. Anyway, all of this is to Descartes' credit. And you see, he's a very rigorous thinker. He thinks about all these little um, contingencies, like maybe that's a figment of my imagination. But then, uh, oh, and then he formulates, I'll go through this quickly because I, uh, how am I doing for time? So far so good, you have, you've taken 15 minutes. Okay, yeah. okay, I'm going to accelerate them. There, there are three big problems that, that, in a sense, we inherited from Descartes. Uh, one of them is my field, cognitive science, the, the field of trying to explain how and why organisms, human and non-human, can do all the things they can do, talk, recognize things, reason, etc. That's an easy problem compared to the so-called hard problem, which is also, we can, it wasn't named by Descartes, but we can thank Descartes for it, and that is having explained how and why organisms can do everything they can do, you know, uh, now explain how and why they can feel. That it feels like something to be able to do all that stuff, or it feels like anything at all. That's the hard problem. I, I haven't got time to explain why it's so hard. All I can tell you is that the reason it's so hard has to do with causality. It turns out that once you've solved the easy problem, which means explaining everything that anybody can ever do, there's no causal degrees of freedom. There's no room for saying, oh, and by the way, you also feel and the 
and feeling is a biological trait and the purpose of feeling is blah, blah, blah. Every theory that tries to explain how and why we feel turns out to be superfluous. Once you solve the easy problem, there's, I don't, we don't need any more explanation. If you start to say, well, okay, um, the reason that you feel pain when somebody pinches you is because if you didn't feel it, then, then, then you wouldn't react, you wouldn't pull your, or you'd, let's say if you stick your hand in the fire, you wouldn't pull your hand out of the fire if you didn't feel it. Well, the easy problem explained the mechanism of when, when you stick your hand in the fire. And by the way, when you pull your hand out of the fire, you don't feel it yet. You feel it a little bit later. So the <laughs> feeling comes a little bit later. But never mind. Even if it came at exactly the same time as you pulled it out, if you've explained everything you can do, which includes avoiding fire and learning to, learning to, to, um, to uh, stay away from fire and not, not get burnt a second time, if you explain all that doing capacity, it's not clear what the functional causal role of feeling really is. And this is related to questions like free will and so on. I can't talk about it here, but uh, they're interesting and I still have a smile on my face. Right? But we're getting there. The third problem is the other mind's problem. The other mind's problem is a variant of the kinds of things that Descartes said you couldn't be sure about. You can't be sure that other creatures, other organisms, have a mind at all. They act like they're doing it, but that's doing. That's the easy problem. Right? So that's all Descartes and that's all good. According to Descartes, though, and this is where Descartes violated his own very rigorous standards of reasoning. He said, you can't be sure that, you can't be sure that, but animals, by which he meant non-human animals, are just reflex machines. When you put them on a, when, when, uh, on a table and you do a vivid section on them, you tie them down and you cut them open and they get scream and howl, never mind, that's just reflexes. It's just doings, easy problem. They don't feel a thing. He had a complicated, not very logical theory about why humans feel and has something to do with God and the pineal gland. I really won't bother you about that. But he, he didn't doubt that humans felt. The cogito guaranteed that humans felt. But the other mind's problem also guarantees that there's no way I can know whether anybody else is feeling anything. I can be sure I feel something. I can't be sure you are. And I certainly can't be sure that my dog is when my dog is screaming. Allegedly, um, Descartes had a dog, and uh, it's hard to imagine that he could have said these outrageous things, encouraging uh, or uh, exonerating vivisection uh, uh, without anesthesia, because it's just reflex. Just don't, don't pay any attention to that. It's just reflex. So that's Descartes' error. In a world where there is no feeling at all, I'm still. I'm getting on the verge of no longer smiling. In a world where there, where there, in a world where there's no feeling, say on another planet where there's all stuff, there's avalanches and maybe um, uh, waterfalls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, nothing matters. To matter for anything to matter means mattering for feeling organisms, feeling creatures. Mattering is essentially about feeling. Everything else is just facts. So in a feelingless world, nothing matters. And there's no such thing as ethics or morality. Right and wrong is all bouncing off feelings. It's not, even when it sounds like you're talking about um, economics and environment, environment would, environment would mean nothing if there weren't feeling creatures in this world. We don't talk about the uh, environmental problem on Mars. And I haven't got time to talk about it now because I really want to get through more, but, but pain and pleasure are not quite the same kind of thing. It's pain that matters. Pleasure only matters in the sense that, okay, I'm gonna, it's going to sound a little dicey, but I have a paper on this anyway. Um, let's say I get 12 orgasms and my neighbor gets 14 orgasms. Orgasms don't matter ethically, but maybe I might be hurt by the fact that he got 14 and I only got 12, okay? So in that sense, pleasure is relevant, but only in the sense of being deprived of pleasure, just like being deprived of food, can be painful. So it's pain, not just feeling, but the negative side of the pleasure-pain continuum that matters. Um, and then I'm going to talk about a kind of a trade-off, and now the smile is really gone from my face. The trade-off between Taste, and I really mean taste in every sense, and torment. Taste of food, but even taste in sports.
tasting clothes. That's, what I, that's the dichotomy I'm going to be talking about. And I'm going to be talking about the same dichotomy, luxury, stuff that, are, that you have but you don't really need, it's not necessary, and necessity, which is stuff that you need. This is necessity. These people are starving. They need food. This is luxury. This is orgasm. And this is suffering. I want to point out to you that we have in Toronto something remarkable on earth. It's called Toronto Pig Save. These wonderful people go out, I don't know if every day or every week, to the uh, slaughterhouse where they transport pigs and they, and they give them water. These are pigs that are by that time starving and thirsty and terrified after a miserable short life. And these people give them water. I can't guarantee, by the way, when the smile goes off my face that I will always be able to keep my composure. This, these scenes have a huge effect on people that have feelings. One of the people that, um, that gives water to these pigs is right now, maybe you've heard about it, but perhaps I could ask you to raise your hands if you've heard about it. Anita Cranch is, is being uh, um, sued, in fact, t taken to criminal court for giving water to these pigs. I have, maybe she's there, I have an inner pig. It's because of Toronto pig say, but whenever I ask myself about things like about the meaning of life and what's important, I always consult my inner pig. This is a pig who's just about to be killed in a, in a half an hour after wretched life without anesthesia. It's not euthanasia. Anybody that tells you it's euthanasia, don't even give them the time of day. It's horrors in that slaughterhouse, and there's no way to make it anything but horrors. It's terror going there, and misery, and thirst, and, and lots of the pigs are injured or, or, or sometimes even dead by the time they get to the slaughterhouse. My inner pig, whenever I get mixed up about what really matters, my inner pig reminds me, you know, you've had a pretty damn good life. Lots of orgasms. Maybe not as many orgasms as you thought you'd like to have or that you deserve. I haven't had any of that and I'm about to die. Painful. Humanity's greatest crime against humanity was the Holocaust. I can attest to it. 30 members of my family were killed, murdered in the Holocaust. I only discovered, they were so terrorized by that that I only discovered that I was of Jewish origin when I was in my teens. It was kept systematically hidden from me because they were so traumatized by what happened to them. So the, hor the, the, the worst horror that humans have ever visited on humans was the Holocaust. But it's not the worst horror that humans have ever visited on anybody. Now can you, can you uh, hit the... Yeah. This, for those of you who haven't seen it, is the... Um, is the Kill counter. How many have seen the animal kill counter of Occupy? Okay, could you raise it so that we can see the figures? Yep. Okay. When when it started, everything was at zero. But leave that on for a while. Okay. As I speak, that's how many animals are being thank you are being um, slaughtered for taste for orgasms. Those of you who have decided not to videotape this talk, if you want to get this website on your, on your, uh, on your uh, um, iPhone, turn it on so you'll see how far we got at the end of the talk. Can I get back to my... Normally I would leave that on another screen so that as I talk you see why it is that what I'm talking about feels so urgent. It was... Yeah, okay. Um, so the greatest crime of all not the greatest crime of humanity against humanity, but humanity's greatest crime of all is that. It's true that uh, in the case of Jews, they were being killed because they were Jews. Because it was based on racial hatred. 
With animals, we're more neutral. We're not killing them. Or this, the ones among us who are not sadists are not killing them just out of hatred or out of hatred at all. We're killing them for orgasms, for gustatory orgasms, for pleasure. We'll get to the question of necessity in a moment. I just want to wait for the count to be finished before I enter the question of necessity. There is no horror that we've inflicted on animals that we have not also inflicted on people. You've already seen it with the, uh, with the Holocaust. Subjugation, uh, slavery, torture, murder, rape, genocide. We've done it all to our own species. But with people, we've outlawed it. It's officially illegal almost everywhere on the planet. It wasn't always. And most people are against it. Most people would never do those things to a person. But with animals, it's all legal. And most, almost all of us demand it and sustain it. That's why this is the greatest crime of all. And at the end of my talk, I'll um, quote for you some people who, uh, some rather famous people who have expressed themselves on this subject. Can I ask Sarah and uh, Rebecca, how's the takaut coming? Yeah, very soon. Very soon, okay. I don't want to go into anything that I, okay. Um, well, okay, I'll, I'll go over what it is that we, I actually asked you. Um, this is Mathieu Ricard. I really need the, the, the totals fast because, I, because I'm getting to the transparency that requires it. Um, Mathieu Ricard is the one who gave the idea of asking you that first question. He always starts his talks uh, with that question. Mathieu Ricard is a biophys biochemist or biophysicist who's also a... Buddhist monk. I'm not here to preach religion in any way, but he wrote a remarkable book on a plea for animals. And the Buddhists have a pretty good scorecard compared to other religions. It's not perfect, but it's much better. Uh, can I, is there a way that I can skip this slide without showing what comes? Is, I don't know how. I have to, yeah, I, I to that, skip this one. This was the point at which I thought I'd have the data. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, hmm. That's good. I'm not sure it's going to work. Can you turn it off? If you can turn it off and then just come back in on the slide afterwards. Uh, yeah. So we'll see if it can be done. <coughs> so just, just go to that this one. This one? Like uh, wait a second. Let me look at it. Two, no, two, no, don't, don't do that. Quebec. Yeah, go okay. to Quebec. Yeah. Okay. All right. Here. <coughs> okay. Uh, so I'm skipping two slides that are waiting for the results of your questionnaire. Um, Quebec had a really bad record with how it dealt with animals for the longest time. It's still worse in Canada. But, uh, but it adopted, at least in a, in a, carte, in a Descartes way, it, it's adopted a, a, an official principle, Law, law 54, that says that animals are not, near just, not just property. It's bad enough that they're property at all. They're not just property. They're also sentient beings. That means they feel and that they have biological needs which have to be met. Now, on paper, that means nothing. I mean, the reason that it got through, despite all of the industries that are based on making animals suffer agony, was because it has no implications in itself. But I'm going to suggest to you that it does have implications, and there is something, that, and we are doing it. We're going to use it legally in order to get further than that. This is it. Uh, in fact, Paul McCartney mentioned this a lot. How many, how many of you knew this quote from Paul McCartney that if slaughterhouses had glass walls, everyone would be a vegetarian? Yeah. Um, the idea is to use the law, the, the current regulations on what you're allowed to do to the pigs and to cows and to the chickens and to the, all the creatures, are ridiculously weak and insufficient. You would never, never, never. Uh, allow those laws to apply to your child or to your, or your, to your home animals, your cat or your, your dog. You never let them do those things. But you can do them with the pigs and the chickens that, that are giving us our gustatory orgasms. You can do it. Uh, but you can't do anything at all 
not everything. There are some things that are even, even, uh, even with, the, with, the, with the right to kill them for food are illegal. So the first step is to use Law 54 to install CCTV in all places where you breed animals, where you transport animals, where you use animals, and where you kill animals, so that it records what's actually being done with them to see whether at least it complies with the weak rules that we have now. And not only should it be, should there be CCTV in all those places, but because you couldn't possibly, there's so many places, you couldn't possibly uh, have inspectors that are, gonna, that are gonna look at all of those. So I suggest, and this is a, a spin-off of, of, of the stuff that I do in open access, is that it should be, um, it should be crowdsourced to the web so that starting with dedicated people like this, people can, citizens can look and when they, uh, it's coded so that when you see that, some, that a rule is being violated, you can report it. I predict that that will not only help enforce the, the, the much too weak rules that there are now, but it will also awaken people to what horrors are allowed. And if this, I'm not going to talk about in this talk, there is a second phase you can ask me in the question period. If, it, if this succeeds, succeeds, as I believe it will, and I'll try to give you evidence here in a second that it will, if this succeeds in sensitizing people to the horrors, so that you know what your orgasms are costing in torment and agony to innocent creatures, I think there's going to be a steady increase of the kinds of people who say, no, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. Um, veganism is obviously the, the, the end goal over here, which is to stop doing anything that uses animals. That's unnecessary. I still need the data over there. <laughs> how, how close are we? Okay. Uh, in, in a sense, it, it, yeah. Okay. 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 That's good enough. Okay. I will. I will now go back since I can go back. Yeah. Uh, where is? That's true. Yeah. Yeah, I've done that already. That's okay. fine. So, for the first question, uh, 106 of you said it's not necessary um, for you to eat meat in order to survive and be healthy. 17 said it, 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 it is. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, the wrong question. That's not what I wanted to give. 126 of you, I, I really read that. 126 of you said that you, that you believe it's wrong to cause suffering unnecessarily. Only eight of you said that it's not wrong to cause suffering unnecessarily. So the vast majority of you are, I don't know what adjective to use without, without um, dissing people who said it's okay to hurt without necessity, but I would say at the very least they're decent people, and that's what I predict, that most people are decent. They wouldn't knowingly condone hurting, causing suffering without necessity. Now, of those people, 17 think it's necessary to eat meat. So in a, in a sense, they say, I'm, if they were the ones who say, I'm against hurting unnecessarily, they're saying, I'm against hurting unnecessarily, but it's necessary to eat meat for my health and my survival. 106 of you say it's not. And then I ask the same question here. Do you think that animals really suffer? And 115 of you think they do. Only seven think they don't. There's hope for the seven who think they don't if they're not among the psychopaths who say it's okay to cause suffering unnecessarily. There's hope for those because uh, there's evidence that they do suffer. There's also, I will also, in fact, I skipped some of this stuff. Uh, there's evidence that the first premise is wrong. It's not true for those, uh, for those uh, 17 who think it's necessary to eat meat for health and survival. Um, it's not true. And in fact, what could be better evidence than, than the vegans you have in front of you? I mean, I'm 71 years old and I'm in fairly good uh, health. Uh, so I don't think it's necessary for survival and health, and neither does the medical profession and the dietetic profession. It's just the food industry that keeps telling you, drink your milk, you need it, you need it for strong bones and so on. 
Uh, you can look at that statement from the Dietetic Association in detail later. When it comes to um, when it comes to suffering, this is the one that I told um, uh, asked Carl not to put up. If you have the courage, go to that URL or put in Google uh, Scholar uh, Google suffering at, at, um, slaughterhouses. Pardon me, not suffering uh, slaughterhouses. And then repeat that you think there's no suffering in that. Okay. Do you eat meat? Well, what we got over here was 101 people. So let me repeat the, the data. 126 say they wouldn't hurt unnecessarily. They, they think it's wrong to hurt unnecessarily. 106 say they don't think it's necessary uh, to eat meat, for, so it's not necessary. And 115 say that animals really do suffer, and yet 101 still eat meat. Now, don't worry, I'm not here to uh, I'm not here to uh, incriminate you. I didn't. I wasn't born a vegetarian either. And in fact, um, I became a vegetarian at 17. They, these guys beat me because uh, because I became a vegetarian at 17 but I only became a vegan six years ago. And I can honestly say that that is the biggest, or certainly one of the biggest, shames in my life. That I can never go back and fix it. But I know that what, during those years when I was vegetarian, and people would say, well, what about the suffering of the, of the, of the, of the cows and the, cow, the calves and the chickens that they, that they crush and all of those? I'd say, yes, there's that, but in principle, in principle, you could get milk and you could get um, uh, eggs without hurting anybody, in principle. So they suffer in practice, but I keep on supporting it because in principle you could do it another way. I would say that in that respect I'm exactly the same as the, I was exactly the same as the meat eaters all those years. I'm almost done. Uh, if the sensitization of people to the real suffering works, and the decent majority, and it's clear that the questionnaire shows that you're, you have the decent majority over here, people will realize that what it means to suffer and what it means to do something that causes suffering unnecessarily. And then I have another, I have a plan, it's not a plan B, it's a plan two to follow from that. I'll talk about that maybe in the, um, in the question session. Uh, what, I, what I can already say is that if, if, if uh, how many vegans here, by the way? Okay, if, if each vegan converts, well, normally a pyramid scheme is, 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 doesn't work. I mean, if you, if you tell somebody, send me a hundred dollars, and, uh, and, and send this message out to 10 more people, and eventually when it gets your turn, you'll get, you'll get 100 times $100 back. That doesn't work because it exhausts, as you see, the, the population of the planet. Within 12 steps, there's nobody left. And, and the, the last rung, the biggest one, has been built out of $100 and will never get it back. But if the same pyramid and the same scheme works, if you, as a vegan, can convert six people to become a vegan, and it's not enough that they become a vegan, but they convert, convert six people, then in 12 steps the whole planet is vegan. So it is feasible. Each vegan commits, okay. Um, now I'm gonna, I have to come over here to, the trouble is I can't read it from that distance. Maybe I can read it up there. Mm -hmm. Yes, give me that. Hang up. Okay, I'm, I'm almost done. Isaac Besheva Singer was a Nobel laureate and uh, also a survivor. In his essay, wrote what uh, the the letter writer. This is this is written to a mouse. What do they know? The mouse who's just been injured and died. What do they know? All these scholars, all those philosophers, all the leaders of the world about such as you. They've convinced themselves that man the worst transgressor of all the species, is the crown of creation. All other creatures were created merely to provide him with food, pelts, to be tormented, 
exterminated. In relation to them, all people are Nazis. For the animals, it's an eternal Treblinka. Treblinka was one of the notorious concentration camps. So uh, a, a representative writer for, for the Jewish uh, nation also sees the analogy with the Holocaust. Uh, uh, J.M. Kutzi is another Nobel laureate and, uh, and uh, a great writer. Uh, by the way, both of these people were, uh, were vegetarians. Let me say it openly. We're surrounded by an enterprise of degradation, cruelty, and killing, which rivals anything that the Third Reich, that's the Nazis, was capable of, indeed dwarfs it. In other words, it's worse. In that ours is an enterprise without end, self-regenerating. Think of the kill counter that I showed you before. Bringing rabbits, rats, poultry, livestock ceaselessly into the world for the purpose of killing them. There are people, and now I'm talking about the questionnaire, there are people who have the capacity to imagine themselves as someone else. There are people who have no such capacity. When the lack is extreme, we call them psychopaths. They just have no, they don't care if someone else is hurt. And there are people who have the capacity but choose not to exercise it. I don't know what the, what the people who said it's all right to hurt unnecessarily are. I doubt that they're psychopaths, but there may be among those people who haven't given it enough thought yet. Bertrand Russell talking about it in another context, he's not here talking about animals and veganism, but his words apply, and I'm sure that he would endorse this as well. What he says is, I say that this is fiendish cruelty, and nobody whose natural sympathies have not been warped by dogma or whose mortal nature was not absolutely dead to all sense of suffering, could maintain that it's right and proper that that state of things should continue. He was actually talking here about, um, well, the equivalent of Mother Teresa, the Catholic Church inducing um, poor, sick people to reproduce as much as possible, even if it produces uh, uh, enormous amounts of suffering. That was what he had in mind. He was talking about why he wasn't a Christian. I used it for my own uh, paper on why I'm not a carnivore. And finally, the moral philosopher Jeremy Bentham, in his introduction to the principles of moral legislation, said the question is not, can they reason? That was Descartes' question. Nor can they talk, certainly not language, but can they suffer? These are, uh, these are some references if you want them. That's my personal, that's my inner pig. And this is Joanne MacArthur's remarkable photograph of those um, pigs that uh, the Toronto Pigs Save People go to every week. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to Professor Harnad for this eye-opening and necessary talk. Thank you very much.